So my name is Dr. Michelle Chappelle. I'm working at the Henderson Community College and our event this today is what does what does MOK dream means to me? Um, we you. have Dr. Eunice Taylor here today. I don't know. And bear with me for a minute. Um, Dr. Eunice Taylor's education. She has a diploma in nursing from the Freedom Hospital School of Nursing. She has a bachelor's degree in health care management some, from Southern Illinois University. She has a Master of Arts in Human Resources Development. She has a Master of Science in Nursing Education, and she also has a Doctor of Psycho Philosophy in, from Capella University. Her military background, she was an Air Force major. She was the Director of Global Patient Movement for the Department of Defense. She, she served as a Chief Flight Nurse and Senior Nurse executive, executive. She traveled to every continent in, in, the, in the capacity of a nurse officer. She was also a ambassador representing the United States. She also participated in numerous U.S. military operations over 20 years. She has been deployed to Southwest Asia as a flight commander, and also she was an evacuation element um, in Saudi Arabia. She was also a chief nurse consultant to senior medical officers and the director of, of the United States Air Force Mobile Command. She retired from the military, the Air Force, November 20th after 21 years of service in 2001. Her civilian clinical nursing experience, she's a full-time faculty at the Lawrenceville Community and Technical College. She's been a clinical nurse in the NICU and a flight nurse in Omaha, Nebraska at St. Joseph's Hospital. She's also uh, worked as a public nurse, health nurse in Australia. She's also been a clinical nurse and her title goes on and on. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Taylor. Dr. Taylor, can you hear us? I do believe so. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, oh. I do. <laughs> OK, well, I'm going to give the control a little bit to you because you know what I'll do. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, I kind of wanted to take a half a second to say that um, it gives me great pleasure to talk to you a little bit today about Dr. Martin Luther King and what his dream has meant to me. Um, as as my friend and colleague was reading off that resume, it just dawned on me that 30 years ago today, um, I was just landing in a place called Zweibrück in Germany in preparation for a Desert Shield Desert Storm. So it's, it's amazing how quickly time goes by. But anyway, I don't. That's another story. Today we want to talk a little bit about um, my thoughts and feelings about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So I put up this slide, um, trying to go through some things, trying to figure out, um, you know, just where to go with this because there's there's so many way places I could go. But in lieu of the events that have occurred in the last couple of weeks, I put up this sign that says, "Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere." So sort of reflect on that as we talk a little bit today about my memories of Dr. King and that particular day. So if my next slide moves, there we go, oops. Um, it's the I have a dream, and I know that picture is a little bit blurry, but this should kind of give you an idea of the multitude of the people that were there and, um, and the feeling of what was going on. Um, this happened on the 28th of August, 1963, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. I'm originally from Washington, D.C., and we lived about 22 blocks just due north of the uh, the center of town, the center of town being the mall, okay? Um, the, the day was hot. I can remember very much my mother being very concerned because um, she thought there was going to be a riot with all the people in town and apparently so did everybody else um, and there was probably I would say maybe about 200,000 people at this event and, and, and may have been less or more I, I, I didn't count them 
But it, I just remember it was a very, very hot day. And I was sharing with Michelle that of all the events that occurred, that have occurred in Washington, D.C. while I was growing up, this one had a very um, different sense, a very different feel. Um, people came to, to, uh, to, to listen to a multitude of speakers, but also to listen to Dr. King. Dr. King was, was a reverend, was a um, uh, licensed practicing minister, and um, they had heard him speak in you know, a variety of places. And I can remember a lot of people thinking, well, here, here's the savior. This is going to be the savior of the peoples. Um, and, and Dr. King had a lot of things going on. He was under investigation by the FBI, by J. Edgar Hoover. Um, I can remember that the president at the time was um, John F. Kennedy and his brother was the attorney general. And they were a little bit frightened, uh, but they they stood and they listened. So I thought before I kind of got into my memory about this, I wanted to kind of take a step back because you kind of have to understand how he got to this place. You know, his talk was about freedom. His talk was about jobs. Um, and you may be asking yourself, well, in 1963, didn't people have jobs? Didn't people have freedom? Well, some people had jobs and some people had freedoms. So let's take a step back and it won't be very long, but I think to understand where, how we got to this place, you have to go take a step back. So a um, couple of things that happened. Um, the first cases of, of civil rights that came up started with the Dred Scott case. And this went on for a multitude of years and then finally accumulated in 1857 with the U.S. Supreme Court. And basically what it said is that African um, uh, or Americans of African descent, whether free or slave, um, uh, were not considered uh, citizens of the United States and therefore could not sue in federal court. And so the court ruled and declared that Congress lacked the power to ban slavery in the U.S. and U.S. territories, and that the rights of slave owners were constitutionally protected by the Fifth Amendment because slaves were categorized as property. And that had been determined some years back. So this basically sort of lit the fuse for the momentum for the anti-slavery movement with the abolitionists and served as a stepping stone um, for the Civil War. So let's come a little bit further. <clears throat> and we have one of the first Civil Rights Acts that was signed in 1866. Okay, and so this, this law basically said all persons born in the United States, with exception to American Indians, were, quote, hereby declared citizens of the United States. So back in 1866, African Americans were declared citizens of the United States, which guaranteed that everybody had full and equal benefits of laws and proceedings for the security of person and property. So this made us, made African Americans not property anymore, okay? Um, we had a group of radical Republicans, and not my words, that's the documentation that came out of the, the language that I was reading, who believed that the federal government had a role in shaping a multiracial society in the post-war South. And so they thought this would be the one, you know, a great thing to happen. And they had this ratification of the 13th Amendment in December of 1865, basically which abolished safe slavery. So you have to ask yourself, okay, this is all well and great. You know, civil war is over. Uh, everybody's got rights. The Emancipation Proclamation has happened. Why did this fail? Well, it was very simple. They had a law, but it had no teeth to it, okay? It left the fighting up to the victims themselves to find the basic relief. In the meantime, while this was going on, we had these so-called black laws or also known as what they call Jim Crow laws. So these things popped up. Our second Civil Rights Act came in March of 1875, and this was known as the Forced Act. 
and it was introduced basically as an amnesty bill for the former Confederates, but it also incorporated that all citizens, regardless of color, had access to accommodations, theaters, public schools, churches, cemeteries, the whole nine yards. But the bid, the bill sort of forbade the bearing of any person from jury service on account of race, and it provided that all laws brought under the new law could be tried in federal, but not state courts. So what happened? How did this fail? Well, the United States Supreme Court declared this law unconstitutional in 1883. And they looked at a whole series of civil rights cases and they, they recognized that the 14th Amendment to the Constitution granted Congress the right to regulate the behavior of states, but not individuals. So this brought on a new case, this case known as Plessy versus Ferguson back in um, 1896. And in this court decision, it found that separate but equal facilities for blacks and whites was considered constitutional. And you can read a little bit more of this as you go through your own history and courses. So Plessy versus Ferguson, U.S. Supreme Court, 1896, basically ruled separate but equal facilities were constitutional. And Plessy versus Ferguson upheld the principle of racial segregation for the next century. We're talking probably about the next hundred years or so. So the ruling provided justification for segregation on trains, buses, public facilities, churches, hotels, theaters, schools, the whole nine yards. In short, the Plessy versus Ferguson uh, decision relegated African Americans to second class citizenship. And this would continue until Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. Think about that for a second. 1896 to 1954. We had Jim Crow laws, no civil rights, and you basically African Americans were not considered citizens of the United States of America. The next Civil Rights Act would not be signed until 1964. So what what's going on here? Um, you and this is a, like I said, this is a very quick rush through history, but you have Rosa Parks deciding on a very hot day after working very, very hard. She was not about to get up and get out of her seat. And so she was arrested and her actions then inspired the the uh, boy, uh, Montgomery boycott, bus boycott. And here's where you find Dr. King. Um, this boycott lasted more than a year. And moving a little bit forward, you have Jim Crow laws are still in effect in the South. You have murder and mayhem still occurring in the South. You have voter intimidation, intimidation church bombings, school bombings, home bombings, kidnappings, lynchings, and separate but not equal in effect. We had, I can remember the um, Freedom Riders. They were um, a group of individuals who were from the North who would meet to plan on how to get African Americans signed and registered to go vote. And the Freedom Riders were basically called these um, invaders into the South. Um, these individuals were beaten they were arrested. Some of them were murdered. Um, as you can see in the picture there, I don't know if you can see that very well, but you know, the Greyhound bus company took a real beating. Um, this was a Greyhound bus that was uh, firebombed. Um, people did get out and were safe. Um, you can see in the, this other uh, picture, the colored waiting area, basically private property, no, no waiting, no uh, parking. Um, you could only drink out a certain fountain. Um, some of you may even remember this individual who uh, died last year, um, Congressman Lewis, who was um, one of the uh, mentors with Dr. King. Um, and so you can understand and hopefully you can understand how these things were starting to brew and to fester. 1963 was a very pivotal year for Reverend Dr. King. 
He was arrested on the 12th of April in 1963 for a nonviolent activity in um, Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, Several clergymen from that area wrote him or published a letter in the Birmingham News and basically calling him out. And they were condemning him for being involved in these things. See, they wanted him to be quiet and to be, you know, to preach um, in his church. Okay. So while he was in prison, he penned this uh, letter called Letters from the Birmingham Jail. And if you haven't read it, you probably should. And he wrote it basically in about a day. And his letter was in response to the ch- to the charges that the those eight cl- uh, clergymen had laid against him and his supporters for participating in nonviolent acts in Birmingham. And his his this book basically gives you insight into his mind into his thoughts towards the importance of freedom and the importance of having civil rights. And it would set the tone upon building on this march for uh, August uh, in 1963. Also, just, you know, not quite a couple of months after that, one of his dear friends, Dr. Uh, Megger Evers, was assassinated on 12 June in his um, front yard, um, in front of his family, in front of his children. And um, I remember that day. And we all sort of thought that, you know, the the civil rights uh, move was basically going to die that day. And I think that's when Dr. Martin Luther King and the members of the um, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and everything else, he was NAACP, um, they, they were having a lot of battles about, you know, maybe we should just stop. Maybe we should just stop. But Dr. King was very adamant about having rights not only just for african americans you have to understand his whole purpose was yes getting rights and getting jobs and getting freedom for african americans but in his mind it was important that for one it goes for all okay because when when you oppress and suppress one you suppress and oppress everyone so here we have some thoughts from the speech. I don't know if you all have listened to his speech or not, but you should. It's about 15 minutes long, maybe not too much long, but about 15 minutes. And he talks about the 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 things that are we hold very dear to us. The Constitution of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, the the 14th and uh, 15th amendments. Now, in 1963, I was 11 years old. And in my school, we would stand and we would say the Pledge of Allegiance. And at that time, the under God hadn't been filtered into the Pledge of Allegiance, even though it was there, it hadn't filtered in yet. And we would stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance we would stand and also say the prayer because at that time we still had prayer in school and we would sing the Star Spangled Banner and we would also sing Lift Every Voice and Sing in my school. But when it came to the Pledge of Allegiance of the United States, sometimes I just could not say it because to me, and it was just to me, maybe it was to others, it wasn't true. I didn't believe it because The Pledge of Allegiance at the time was, I pledge allegiance to the United States. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's how we used to say it before it had under God written in. Well, it was already written in, but we didn't say it. I could get, I would get choked up for that. Because as an 11 year old African American child going to school, I knew that there was no justice for all. It was not equal. I did not have the same rights. I knew that if I took on a trip, I could only stay in certain hotels. I could only drink out of certain water fountains. I knew that um, there would be the possibility that my father could get kidnapped. I knew 
that my brother could get my brothers could get kidnapped and harmed. And I knew that growing up in Washington DC at the time was considered a safe place. Which is why we didn't travel much because where, where could you go? OK, if you didn't have that green book, where could you go? And if those of you don't know what the green book is, that'd be a good assignment for you. To find out about the green book. I think it was a movie, but anyway, moving on. So we that day when I go back to that day, it was a hot day. My dad wanted to take us down and my mother said absolutely no. So my father was the kind of person who wanted to to hear and wanted to listen. And so he went down, he walked down again, 22 blocks. He walked down and I remember him telling me the sense of peace and quiet being amongst all those individuals that were down there. And from where I lived, you could hear the roar of the people who were talking. It seemed like everything just went up and the voices just carried on the wind. But some of the main points Dr. King talked about was we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And he took that charge back to the founders of the United States of America who drafted that document. Because in short, he said that this was a promissory note. Now, I think everybody knows what a promissory note is. But the founders of this country, when they wrote the Constitution, even though they could not consider African Americans as whole men, we were considered and women weren't even considered at all. We were considered two thirds of a person. We were still considered to have certain unalienable rights. Ergo the word a promissory note. That we were still guaranteed to have these life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. But as Dr. King said, America defaulted on that note to the people. OK. What he said was rather that the Negro had been given a bad check with insufficient funds, his words, not mine. And so the march then was a request for freedoms and for security of justice, because at this time there was no justice. At this time, if an African American in the South showed up to vote, even though they were registered, they had to count the jelly beans in the jar. Now, I don't know about you, I've played that game once. You never get the number of jelly beans correct. Okay. Um, just thinking about it, just, you know, it makes me cry sometimes and going, really? But that's true, people. I tell you, that is so true. Okay. He wanted, and 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 every everybody there at that time wanted to have the removal of segregation, to move to a more, um, to remove the injustice of racism and move towards equality. But the message that was coming back from Congress was You're just going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait. OK, tell me what is wait? 19, 1896 to 1954. That's what? A little over 60 some odd years. That's a lot of waiting. So his point was we could not return to business as usual. The Vietnam War was coming up. There was no way you could ask someone to die for their country overseas but not give them the rights back in the United States of America. OK. That was not a fair exchange. So some of the things he thought about was are some of the things that sort of played on my mind after listening to his words again was that he cautioned um, African Americans to be nonviolent. He cautioned everybody to be nonviolent. Um, to have grace and dignity 
In other words, when they go low, we go high. We've heard that before. And to do it with dignity and discipline and nonviolence. OK, um, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I could walk into the middle of someone with a baton getting ready to beat me over the head. OK, um, police brutality was was brutal during those times. Um, we needed to have the removal of segregation. Uh, the, the schools were becoming desegregated in 1954. That was the law of the land. However, comma, nine black students could not go to school unless they were going to be protected by the, by the um, United States Army at Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. In 1955, the schools in Virginia closed rather than integrate their schools, and they stayed closed for several years. OK. When I think back of Dr. Martin Luther King and his speech, I think of his speech as a speech of hope. It was a speech also of specific action, but it was also his wish that he shared not only with just us Americans, it was a speech that he shared with the whole world. And I put in parentheses, Bloody Sunday hadn't happened yet. To me, it was also a speech of faith to inspire Americans and not to live in despair. But his speech frightened very many people, especially those in leadership, J. Edgar Hoover specifically. It worried uh, JFK and it worried his brother in uh, uh, about the fear of civil rights. And even as Dr. King, Reverend King talked about nonviolence and 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 going through your your life with dignity, um, nobody was telling that to the other side. OK, and so in less than a month after his speech. On the 15th of September 1963, the Ku Klux Klan sent their message in response to Dr. King's speech. And that message was the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. Now you have to understand the 16th Street Baptist Church was basically the, the home of where the NAACP, where the meetings were, where Dr. King would meet and everybody would meet. But what was so vicious about this was that it was on a Sunday. It was on a Sunday with 400 people and children going to church. OK, and on that day, four young girls were killed by the blast. And I will say their names. Denise McNair, McNair, who was 11. Addie Mae Collins, who was 14. Carol Robertson, who was 14. And Cynthia Wesley, who was 14. And there are two more other children, male children, who were murdered. They were beaten by a crowd and left for dead. And that in itself left an impact on me. And here's the picture of those four little girls, and it frightened me to death. I'll, I'll tell you, it frightened me to death, and I lived in Washington, D.C. That event happened in 1963. It was not until 1977 that one of their leaders was convicted of murdering these young girls. He died in prison. But it wasn't until 2000 2000 that Bobby Frank Cherry and Thomas Blatston were also convicted of the deaths of these four young girls. The world was outraged. They were infuriated by this and basically it prompted the support for desegregation, including the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964 in which um, Lyndon Baines Johnson signed um, and the Voting Rights Act, which was signed. And so some of Dr. King's dreams came true. For me, his his dreams of being nonviolent, his dreams of love, his dreams of wanting people to be together, because if you listen to the end of his of his speech, his his dream was to have people come together. Now, it has been several years since that speech has happened. 
and shortly after that, we know that um, the, um, President Kennedy was assassinated and several years later, both Bobby Kennedy and Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King were assassinated in the same year. And again, leaving very uh, marked impressions and imprints for me. But I, I will say this because I know we've got to have have some questions and I want to do leave some time some questions. Dr. King, uh, Reverend Dr. King's speech, I have a dream. Um, it's not done. It's not done. We still have a ways to go and we have made some progress. I think everybody would agree we have made some very big progress. We have made many strides. But as I said in the beginning, Dr. King's his whole purpose was not just to bring just African-Americans along to elevate them to be the savior per se, because that's what we thought of him. His dream was for everybody. So I put some things up here that, you know, are just just words that are his quotations that stood out. And we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. Very true statement. Returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness into a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And for me, that's really important, especially when you think about things that have just recently occurred. The difference between a dreamer and a visionary is that a dreamer has his eyes closed and a visionary has his eyes open. That in itself is very important. And then nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientiousness stupidity. Education is so key. Learning the values of what this man and others strove for just to get to a school so they could get an education. Education is one of the most important things that you can do for yourself, but also do for others. And then injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that still holds true to this day. If we do not recognize the injustices that go on in this country, how can we not look at ourselves and say, how can we fix this? OK, when we have injustice in our own country, we certainly can't go to somebody else's door and try to get them to fix their injustices. My mom used to say you have to clean up your own home first. Don't be throwing, you know, don't be throwing stones. Don't be throwing rocks at somebody else's house. So we have to clean up our act first. And those are the some, you know, some of the things that, you know, when I think about Dr. Martin Luther King, when I think about the struggles, you know, I didn't get here by by accident. I didn't get here by accident. Um, my parents in, instilled in me the value of getting an education and taking advantage of every opportunity that I had. And I was fortunate to be, you know, be born in Washington, D.C., to have an extensive history of family in Washington, D.C. And I say that to mean that my family members, my ancestor slave family members are buried at Mount Vernon. Yes. They worked for the first president of the United States of America. Yes, my family had an opportunity. My family members were slaves in Washington, D.C. My family members as slaves helped to build the Capitol that they tried to tear down several weeks ago, several, several days ago, to help build the, the, the Washington Monument and, and, and the White House. I have very strong ties to Washington, D.C. for a variety of reasons, but we were lucky because we learned, we went to school, we took advantage of the opportunities. And even though I didn't have a book, I didn't have a computer or a typewriter, I had a library and I made damn good use of it. <laughs> OK, 
that you take advantage of the tools and the things that you have. And I think that is what one of the messages that I um, reflect upon when I think about Dr. King is that, you know, you have opportunities. It may not be right where you want it right then and there, but you know what? Small steps, take small steps, and then eventually things do change. Um, where, where do we go from here? Well, I, I can't tell you directly where you can go from here, but I can tell you that we still must keep the conversation going. Um, feelings are going to get hurt, but understand that no one is blaming anybody for the sins of the past. What we have to do is recognize that they existed and we cannot ignore that people, that individuals do have certain unalienable rights and those rights are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness um you don't see too many people grabbing their passports and leaving the united states everybody wants to come here because they recognize what we have here is better than what they have there nobody's going to steal it from us we're a big enough country that we should be able to share and that, I believe, is what Dr. King was trying to tell us, or at least trying to tell me, is that we are big enough as a nation, that we are open enough as a nation to be able to share. You know, I think about our, our Native American brothers and sisters, the, the indigenous persons of this country. Why do they have to carry a green card? Does anybody know the answer to that question? They were born here but yet they have to carry a green card. Think about that for a minute. You know, as you as we've taken just a quick journey, I, I want people to think and spend some time if you get an opportunity to revisit and re listen to Dr. King's speech on that day. It may say something to you a little bit differently than it did to me, and it always does because you know you hear things and go, oh, OK, that was cool. That was important. So spend some time if you can. I think I put the there, there is a link and if not, I'll make sure that um, that uh, we get it out to you that you listen to it and you talk about it and you discuss it and find out what does it mean to you? How can you be a part of the solution and not part of the problem? So with that, I'm just going to close by saying I, I think I opened with the fact that um, when I was in school, we we said the um, lift every voice and sing. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it to you because um, then this conversation will be over very quickly. But I'm going to read the words to you just very briefly because it was a poem and it always speaks to me. So it says lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Now this was written and first said back in 1900 on February the 12th for Abraham Lincoln's birthday. It was written as a poem, but it has been set to words and it's been called the Black National Anthem. But I think the words ring very, very true, especially now. And I would invite you to, to Google it, lift every voice and sing and continue to read on and see what it says to you. Hopefully it says something to you as it does to me. Okay, questions. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Tyler. You're uh, more than welcome. I appreciate that. Um, uh, I, also I also put, put in the in chat, chat um, the survey, survey for this event, so please make sure you fill out the survey for this event. And um, I'm opening up the floor for question. Raise your hand so I can acknowledge you. I can't see them, so. You'll have to read them to me, not unless you want me to stop yeah, you. I don't see none in the chat, but anybody have any questions for Dr. Taylor? Oh, come on. I'm sure you got questions. Yes, Tracy, go ahead.
I'm going to end the slideshow. Is that OK? Yeah, that's fine. Tracy, I think your hand it. You're muted. Uh oh. There you go. OK, I think I messed oh. up. OK, Tracy, <laughs> go ahead and type your question in the chat. Anybody else has a question for Dr. Taylor? I hope so. Dr. Strawn, go ahead, please. I just want to say thank you to, to Eunice for making this presentation and kind of reminding us all of a little bit of the history and stuff. We have so much going on these days that we tend to forget not just this history, but but history and, and things in the past as, as well. So I just appreciate you taking the time and kind of reminding us on where we've been and hopefully a little brighter future on where we're going. So thank you for your your time and, and talking with us today. You are more than welcome. Glad to do it. Dr. Taylor, Tracy said she enjoyed the way you related what's going on, not just reading from a prompt. So she appreciates it. You're more than welcome. You know, when you live history, sometimes it's just easier to talk from your heart. Um, you have to sort of kind of tie lots of things together. And, you know, for me, it was it was living history um, and being there being there in the sense that living in Washington, D.C. and being, you know, sort of being a, a part of it. But um, I know many people couldn't get there and um, it, it, it just says a lot to me. It just does. And, and, I, and hopefully it will say a lot to you as well. Oh, yeah, we have had several conversations and Tracy always says experience you know, it's, it's viable as well as a speaker. So that's why I choose you because we, because those conversations we have had. Um, yes. We have Charles Johnson here. He likes to ask a question. Go ahead, Charles. Well, it's not really a question, just to commend uh, Dr. Taylor. Uh, Dr. Eunice and I have had many conversations sitting in her office at uh, <laughs> OCTC and, and I'm thankful and, and the Tri-State is thankful that, that Dr. Taylor brought her uh, talents to the Davis County area and educating young people in health care and just life itself. She could just be about anywhere in major cities and major areas. So we're thankful and I hope that uh, the tri-state area values the wealth of experience and knowledge and uh, uh, that, uh, you know, that she uh, that that she brings to the classroom and stuff. And uh, so she's she's done a been an inspiration to myself and I know Michelle and and that's why I can't uh, 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 bother Michelle because she acts just like Dr. Taylor. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I, I miss you, miss you, Reverend. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Good Love to see you. you. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Also, um, Leslie said, I buy your first person account and thanks so much for your insight. Um, Angie Watson said your personal experience has made this a touching and compelling presentation. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. And also, Dr. Taylor, when I was reading off your um, credentials of everything you done, you forgot to talk about you are the director of the uh, human relations in Orangeboro, Kentucky. That's correct. Uh, uh, Orangeboro, uh, Kentucky, uh, I'm the uh, president of the of our board. Yes. Yes. And we marched yesterday. Yes, I've seen you on TV. Uh, Michael Connect, go ahead. And everybody who had their hand raised, can you lower your hand, please? Unless you have another question. Uh, Dr. Taylor, I was just curious with your your time in the military. Did you feel that um, uh, racial tensions were greater inside the military or outside the military? Well, you know what? Um, the, I was in the United States Air Force. We were, we were the youngest service. And the United States Air Force was the tip of the spear, so to speak, for getting ahead of issues. The military became desegregated in 1947, I think it was signed, and that was when the United States Air Force became its own. It separated from the Army. And right, right off the bat, the, the Air Force looked at the uh, issues of segregation, and the issues of uh, women in the military. I mean, the whole nine yards. Um, I, I will say this, uh, my, my dad was in the army 
and you know he he had a rough time i won't lie uh and we talked about it a lot and the 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 military of his time was certainly different from the military of my time um you have to understand i'm a little bit mouthy so when things were said to me i would uh, bite back uh luckily i could get away with that but i my my battle in the military was fighting gender issues, mostly men versus women issues, so to speak. Um, and um, the fact that women nurses, uh, medics weren't considered the in, in the military per se. So that was one of my battles. But as things progress, one of the things I, I, I noticed as I um, moved up is that the slow creep of um, I, I don't even want to call them insurgents, but it was a slow creep of individuals who, you know, who had alternate ideas and alternate thoughts. And, you know, one of the big things about being being in the in the medical field is that you have control of the size needles that people get. <laughs> so it's amazing how quickly people can change their minds when they're getting to get get a, a, a big a big needle. So did I did I have issues? Yes, I did. But I always try to correct the issues right away. Um, we spent many times talking about um, they would have these social action activities so people could learn um, about feelings because a lot of this is about feelings. You know, you take people from across the United States and stick them in a room. Everybody's going to have a different viewpoint. Um, some people say soda. Some people say Coca-Cola. I had no idea that meant something different to people, you know. So, um, you know, I learned that uh, folks from the South think of the Civil War as the invaders from the North, whereas folks in the North think of the folks from the South as being the separationists. So it's all about getting the language correct, getting the education correct. Um, generally, most people, when they got to know me in the military, understood where I was coming from recognized that I had certain expectations and I had a sign on my door that used to say check your egos outside. And so we got along pretty well. Every now and then we'd run across some individuals and we'd have to have a serious woman to nurse woman to person talk or officer to enlisted talk. They got the message really quickly. But nobody blew up my car or did anything disastrous to me. So and I guess because I wasn't really afraid. <laughs> Maybe I should have been. Thank you very much. I appreciated your response. You're welcome. Dr. Taylor, you know, when you travel overseas during this racial tension back in, you know, the 1960s, was you treated differently uh, when you went to Australia and the other continents? Did you feel more safe in those areas than you did in the United States? As a matter of fact, yes, I did. Um, I didn't travel in the 60s, but in the 70s and 80s and all, um, I did. Um, and that's a sorry thing to say because, first of all, um, you know, America was 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 a was a leader. There was a lot of things going on in the 70s and 80s um, with the United States of America. Um, but I, I always felt safe, uh, very respected because at the time America was respected. Not that it's not respected now. I'm sure it is. But, you know, when you wear your uniform, you wore your uniform. Um, shortly after the Vietnam War, however, um, you know, things we, we were not allowed to wear our uniforms out in public um, because there was that, you know, entity of bad stuff. And, you know, I did have people spit on my uniform and it was not because I was African American. It was because I was a member of, of the military. And and so um, that day was not a, a very good day. Um, but uh, most of the time, most of the time overseas, I, I, I felt quite comfortable. Um, Australia was good. Um, England was good. Turkey was good. It, it, it was fine. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh -huh. uh, I have one more question. Dr. Warren, please go ahead. Dr. Taylor, I just want to thank you on behalf of the college uh, for you speaking today. And just uh, uh, the, the thing that spoke to me about your comments is I think we as a people are so guilty sometimes of thinking about history being in 
such a long distant past. And I think the way that you provided, you know, human examples um, and, and personalize it, it's it's a great reminder of us that it, it hadn't been that long ago. Yes. And I think that needs to be up front and center for all of us. And it, it was a nice contrast to uh, uh, how Reverend Johnson's comment spoke to me yesterday, uh, mm-hmm. more as a, a personal responsibility, what that each of us uh, need to embrace of, of how we we go about the future. So thank you for being here today. And uh, it's great uh, hearing your story today. You're more than welcome, sir. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to share. Sometimes I won't shut up, so I have to be careful. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Taylor, we have about 10 more minutes. I know I did this kind of in the middle of people's lunch hour. So does anybody have any questions for Dr. Taylor, Dr. Me? Um, in 1963, Eunice, uh, this is from Elaine, in 1963, Eunice, I was 11, I was, and I was nine watching on a tiny t- television in Fountain City, Indiana. Remember, my parents were watching and learning forward to catch every word, leaning forward to catch every word. I know the broadcast was important and that we were nervous about what might see or hear. And at the end of the speech, I mostly remember how quiet they was. I did not understand what he speak was his speech meant, but much later in life. But I remember watching and listening to at, with my parents as they watched the speech being told and hushed to understand I was witnessing something a historical event. Oh boy, I tell you, that 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 his last words and and I and I remember this exactly. There was such a silence across Washington D.C. that when he concluded his speech and you all know how he built that speech up you could hear the roar you know our television was on but you could hear the roar live of the people after he concluded his speech i mean it just carried on the wind and on the trees and it was just an i get chills thinking about it just right now it just carried so far and so wide and I just I don't know if that was a God thing or what I, I just remember that and I and I shared this with Michelle and I said, you know, that whole day there was hardly any arrests downtown. There were no riots. Nobody overturned the car or did anything crazy. And even even the locals in D.C. basically stayed home. And there was there was nothing you could have dropped a pin in that city and it would have been heard. And, and of course we did. We heard Dr. King and, and his words. So um, it, it was it was just an amazing day. And I, and I remember my father coming home feeling so inspired, a little frightened, but basically feeling inspired and having a sense of hope and a sense of 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 wanting to you know, get all of us kids in, into something, into a life. So I, and, and it was, it was impressive. It was just impressive. Thank you. And then Leslie said, I got chills listening to you talk about it. And then Dr. Lewis said, thank you, Dr. Taylor. You're welcome. Um, if there's any more questions, please raise your hand. If not, I'm gonna let, give you guys the rest of your day back. Dr. Taylor, thank you again for I'm um, doing this presentation for me. I really appreciate it. And you know, we will always continue our conversations. I consider you as a mentor, as a mom. You've been there through me for for a long time. So thank you again. I appreciate that. And being there for me. Of and course. Everybody's saying thank you. You're amazing. Thank you so much. So um that's well, all I have to say before I get all teary out on me. This has been <laughs> wonderful. Thank you for asking.